I think he did think, okay, the, the Maharishi disappointed me, now Janov is it. And I think Arthur may have represented to him uh, the new brilliant father he never had. And part of Primal is to let people go inside themselves, to have a very deep internal experience. All of us have, uh, you know, a million kinds of uh, defenses to protect ourselves. We have our morning paper, our cup of coffee, uh, our telephone, our work, our uh, music, our TV, our radio, our every kind of distraction that just keeps us moving all day. But if you know how it feels when you wake up at four in the morning and the pit of your stomach is aching a bit, you know the feeling of suddenly you are alone without your artifacts, so to speak. And that is what we try to create at the very beginning of therapy. You can shine your shoes and wear a suit. You can comb your hair and look like you. You can hide your face behind a smile. One thing you can hide is when you cripple inside. You can wear a mask and paint your face. You can call yourself the human race. You can wear a collar and a tie. One thing you can hide is when you cripple inside. Well, now you know that your cat has nine lives, babe. Nine lives to itself. But you only got one, and a dog's life ain't fun. Mama, take a look outside. episode 41 of Glass Onion. I'm John Lennon and today we've got a very special one for you. hope I don't say that every time but this one is special because one of the original ideas for this podcast back in uh, early 2019 was to look at John Lennon's psychology and one of the podcasts that I've been listening to for a while and I used to listen to as I commuted around Madrid was the Psychology in Seattle podcast and so today I'm very happy and excited to post a discussion with the host of that program, Dr. Kirk Honda, who's a therapist and a professor, and his co-host, I nearly said the word sidekick, but that's way too patronizing, Humberto Castaneda, who's from Colombia. So I got something out of living in Spain. I can pronounce his name with some confidence. So yeah, this is obviously looking at John Lennon's psychology. Now, Kirk and Humberto did actually do an episode called The Psychology of John Lennon, so I've called mine John Lennon's Psychology. Fans of uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian might get a kick out of that. <laughs> it's a Judean people's front and people's front of Judea kind of situation. Anyway, you get the picture. Kirk and Umberto just happen to be Beatles fans and by extension John Lennon fans, which is pretty handy. I did know that already because they've uh, talked about the Beatles on their show as well. I've always liked their show. I think the way I found it, actually, and I think I tell Kirk during the conversation was uh, they do a series of The Psychology Of, and they take, like, a famous person, and they did Marlon Brando, and then, obviously, John Lennon uh, actually made the suggestion to Kirk originally to do John Lennon. But they've done loads of other shows, you know. I got into Black Mirror a couple of years ago. I was a bit late to the party there, and they did pretty detailed reviews of every single episode, I'm pretty sure. And, you know, they tackle stuff like, anxiety depression they do stuff on social media you know all the kind of i'd say popular psychology but in the best sense of the word you know it's easily relatable and fairly easy to understand i think although at the same time it's never simplified or dumbed down so kirk just has a very good way of delivering information so what i like about the show is the topics and also the combination of kirk and umberto because kirk comes across as very authoritative or well informed might be a better word but, you know, he's very easy to listen to. And Umberto's got this kind of 
I know Latin American energy, if that's not too general, and exuberance. And, you know, they're a great combination. You can kind of tell from listening to them that they've known each other a long time, as they have. They've also played music together. You'll hear about that when we get to the conversation. Anyway, uh, the clips you just heard there were Vivian Janoff, or Janoff. She was the wife of Arthur Janoff, who did the primal therapy with John Yoko in 1970. And that was just a short clip of her, as you heard, talking about basically defense mechanisms. And this is the kind of thing that we're talking about here. I would have loved to have had longer with the guys, but we got an hour together. So we got through a few things. As usual, I had way too many notes. But essentially, we spent a long time talking about the Beatles and John Lennon in general. But we talked about John Lennon's pain, basically, and some of the negative behavior that it caused, uh, not to mention drugs as well and alcohol. Well, alcohol is a drug, but uh, you know what I mean. The other clip was, of course, Crippled Inside, and the vocal take of that. And I thought that was just a very apt song for today's show. I make it clear, actually, during the episode that, you know, Kirk, as he said on the show that he did originally about John Lennon, he, he's not diagnosing him, and we're just speculating, and we make that perfectly clear, I think. But uh, it's interesting, and I think you'll get a lot out of this. You know, we're not really looking for answers. I've almost pretty much given up looking for answers with John Lennon. But uh, on this broad topic, we say also at one point that, you know, people identify with John Lennon, so they can probably identify with his issues. And I think, and I make a bold statement that anyone who listens to this will find at least one thing that they identify with. I've added a number of other audio clips, you know, just to break up the conversation and make it fun for the listener. So you'll recognize John Lennon's voice, I'm sure, at this point. But there's Cynthia Lennon as well. There's a fellow called Gabor Mate, who I would definitely recommend you check out. In fact, I'll probably put a link to one of his talks. And I bring him up in the conversation. He's talking about what addiction is really about. And then um, Fred Seaman pops up briefly to talk about John Lennon's, well, media obsession, you might call it. Or obsession with learning, which I certainly know a little bit about. And then there's a couple of clips. Uh, I don't know who the people speaking exactly are, but one of them relates to the psilocybin experiments at John Hopkins University. I'm just telling you that because it's not made clear during the clip. They were quite groundbreaking in their own way. You know, as usual, the mainstream's miles behind in terms of forward thinking and open-minded thinking regarding drugs. You know, this. I think the war on drugs even comes up a couple of times in this conversation. Absolute joke, to be perfectly honest. You know, this idea of automatically criminalizing addicts anyway pretty sure we get onto that as well and then there's again someone i don't know exactly who is talking but they're talking about the psychological aspect of fame and what happens to people when they get famous so um hope i haven't spoiled it too much for you but uh i'd like to give you a little taster of the clips and as we don't name them during the conversation i'm just telling you what they are now anyways this is a really fun conversation as i said very informative so I'm going to let you get on with listening, and I'll see you on the other side with a few words. Enjoy. Okay, this is Glass Onion on John Lennon. I'm delighted to have with me Kirk Honda of Psychology in Seattle podcast, and his co-host, Umberto. You can uh, pronounce your surname, Umberto, if you don't mind. Oh, yes. Uh, Umberto Castaneda. <laughs> From Colombia. That's right. I went to Colombia in 2015. Stop it. Really? Where did yeah. you go? Oh, I went to loads of places, actually. I mean, I started off in Bogota. I went down to the coffee region. I oh, yeah. stayed on a Medellin? coffee farm. Did you go to Medellin? Yeah, I went to Medellin. I'm a beach bum, so my favorite was the Caribbean coast, you know, Cartagena, Santa Marta. Nice. Yeah, it's fantastic. Caribbean <laughs> coast. <laughs> All right. And then I made the mistake of uh, I set myself a task. I flew back to Bogota, like, domestically, and then I set myself a uh -huh. task of going all the way to the border with, with Ecuador Ooh. on buses. And I was a, an absolute mess by the time I got to Ecuador. But, uh, oh, yeah, that would be I should have just stayed in. Yeah, I should have just stayed in Colombia, to be honest. But uh, I could have warned you, man. My experience as a kid traveling was, was such a hassle because we had to take these long drives. For example, mm. there's this place called Manizales, which is another city in the coffee region. My uncle lives mm. there, and I remember one time we went to visit them, and it's an eight-hour drive, and it's on these mm. tiny winding roads on the cliff sides of mountains so you're yeah, like, yeah, that was, like mm. constantly at risk of dying mm. and and it's super hot in in sections and hum oh man it was brutal awesome. yeah i remember the view the views are fantastic but the roads are really bumpy and i was it's I gotten was much silly. better though but oh, oh i guess it? you went yeah. you were in 2015 so no yeah it was quite recent <laughs> <laughs> the money right. trip has gotten better 
Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, I've got far too many things to cover, so I'm going to just relax and see what we get through. So um, I've been listening to your show for a couple of years, I guess. The first episode I heard was The Psychology of Marlon Brando. I'm oh. fascinated by Marlon Brando. In fact, this, he gets mentioned so much on this podcast that some, some people have said I should call it Glass Onion on John Lennon and Marlon Brando. Because <laughs> <laughs> I find him and John Lennon just so fascinating to me. And I think it's the contradictions as much as, as the talent and everything else. But um, Kurt, can you introduce your podcast, first of all, please, to my audience? Yeah. Psychology in Seattle, we have been doing this for 12 years almost, and we have over a thousand episodes on things like Marlon Brando, John Lennon, <laughs> and 998 other things. Can I ask you guys your sort of John Lennon Beatles origin story, or how do you feel about them? Are you a big fan? Origin story. <laughs> well, origin my God, story. yeah. We, <laughs> well, my origin story. a better phrase. Yeah. yeah. My, my origin story as a Beatles fan is that I was born in 1970, which was arguably the year they broke up, and mm. was in a family that listened to a lot of, you know, just regular top 40 radio. And in the 70s, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo, the Beatles were on pretty much constant rotation on a local oh, yeah. uh, radio station here in Seattle called KJR. It was AM. And so John Lennon was just in my life, uh, if you will. And, oh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> and across the universe until when I became 10, that, that was dumb. But when I became right, 10... you've got to keep this going now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I was nine or 10 years old... I absolutely remember when John Lennon was murdered. I remember I was shopping with my mom because, you know, my mom would take me around because mm. she would be doing her errands. And I remember on the radio all day long, it was John Lennon wall to wall. And mm. everyone was mourning and talking about it. And woman was in high rotation at the time. And mm. I remember really liking that song. Then when I was a teenager... And I was trying to break away from top 40. You know, I'm 15 years old and I fancy myself kind of an alternative kid. And so there's a lot of 60s looking back in the mid 80s or the hipsters of 1985 were not listening to top 40. They were listening to the 60s. And so I went back to the 60s as well and really started listening to the Beatles a lot. And I would sit in my room and pretend I was the Beatles with my tennis racket as a guitar. <laughs> oh, and, wow, of course. Uh, yeah. We've all done that. Awesome. And, <laughs> and in some ways, I kind of learned how to be in a band, how to play guitar in a weird way, and how to harmonize <laughs> by basically just fantasizing that I was the Beatles. And I've been obsessed with the Beatles since 1983 or four. My coffee mug right now is coincidentally rubber sole. I bought this in London at the Beatles memorabilia Ooh. shop right next to the Sherlock Holmes shop there. And uh, Baker Street. Yeah. Right. And I have, you know, just massively to this day, YouTube suggests videos to me every day, mm -hmm. right? That's just when I'm bored, I was oh, what's YouTube has to offer me? Yeah, about a third, a quarter of the videos that are always pumped in my direction, because Google understands me very well, has to do with the Beatles. So I've watched all the documentaries multiple mm. times. Me and Umberto performed from beginning to end Rubber Soul. We learned all the songs backwards and forwards. We performed it live. I've done other kinds of things along these lines. I could go on and on, but that's my origin story. Okay. And um, that's all about Colombia. Were they being Colombia? Well, so I actually, I didn't come across the Beatles until very recently. I heard their Sleepy Jean song or something like that. They had another one called like Glad All Over. I don't know. I, I like them, <laughs> but I'm not so much into that kind of music. It's too poppy for me. Oh, wait. Or I just had an annual. Uh, one of the two. Yeah, there's something um, wrong there, I think. The other origin story <laughs> is that when I was a little kid, my cousin Diego, fantastic organist, he had this mm. Yamaha organ that was a, one of those that have the two keyboards and the pedals that he had inherited from, well, not inherited, but like gotten from his uncle. And he was just becoming a master at that thing. He could play amazing stuff. And whenever I would go over, you know, I, I'd get on it and I'd just like bang on it and stuff. And I didn't know anything. And he started trying to teach me some music. And the first thing he ever taught me was how to play Let It Be. And so like he played the song for me and, and he's like, okay. And then he showed me how to play it. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Mm. 
So it was both like an exposure to the music and also like how to play music. It was really great. So sadly, at my house, I didn't have any Beatles anything. I didn't have tapes or discs, nothing. But at their house, they had the blue and the red, you know, those compilation ones. Oh, yeah. And,、uh, and sadly, that's, they, they didn't have the other albums, but that's what they had. And so I would listen to those. And for the longest time, I just had it memorized the sequence of the songs in my head. So whenever I would hear one of those songs independently, I would always be like, oh, I know what comes next, because that's what <laughs> I, I had kind of grown up with for a few years. Then I had、yeah. this other friend of mine who was older than me. Was, I was in a taekwondo class. And maybe I was like 10 and he was like 17. So he, he was more like a friend of the families. And he was a huge Beatles nut. And I remember going over to his house with my dad a couple times. And in his like room, which was sort of like he had like a basement room, he had all these Beatles albums. And I remember looking at the covers and looking at Sgt. Pepper and being like, oh my God, what is this? So amazing. And then the, the other piece of it was I mentioned that trip to Manizales. Well, one of those trips, when I was a little older, in fact, I think I was 14 at the time, we listened to Beatles the whole way there. So, like, imagine eight hour solid Beatles. Like, we had these tapes and we just like, listened to the songs over and over and over, <laughs> saying, definitely the way that I learned that and Simon and Garfunkel were my harmony master classes. You know, I would listen to them and over time I would be like wanting to sing the harmonies and it's just so amazing. And then when I got to this、yeah. country, you know, when I first started high school here, I was 15, and some of the people there at the high school had this band, and I had never in my life considered being in a band. That thought hadn't entered my mind. It wasn't even like a feasible possibility or, or something, but I loved music and I loved singing. And then they were like, Oh, you want to be in the band? And I'm like,、uh, I don't know. And they're like, What can you contribute to the band? Do you have a keyboard? Well, my little brother has a keyboard. All right, you're in. <laughs> so that was like my entrance <laughs> to the band. And of course, they were all into the Beatles too, especially the Japanese guy in the band, Shun. He was a huge Beatles nut. And then in college, I took music theory, three years of that. And I remember spending a ton of time in the library. Like, I would get all these Beatles books, like every biography I could find, every book <laughs> about their music and everything. I've forgotten more about the Beatles than most people will ever know. <laughs> Because, like, I just read so much, like, especially those first two years. I was obsessed.、Yeah. We learned a ton of their songs, played covers. And it's definitely how I learned a lot of songwriting, deconstructing their songs and figuring out how to play them and stuff like that. Yeah, because they're simple, but they're also deceptive. What a lot of people don't realize is that the early songs, in some ways, are almost as sophisticated as the later ones. But you just don't know it because it comes、yeah. across as very tuneful. That's、yeah. kind of the trick. And I, I used to get this magazine called Total Guitar. And they had like 10 Beatles songwriting tricks. And I, I bought it 20 years ago and I just bought it last year on eBay. I found it. And it's、mm. just fantastic because you realize that、wow. there was sophistication going on from day one. I mean, maybe not Love Me Do, but you know, stuff like that. Right. And、um, I mean, the origin story for a guy in England is basically being born. <laughs> That's your Beatles origin story. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, it's everywhere. But I, I was kind of the same. I got into them when I was 14. And, and I mean, The next three years just drove my family mad. Although my family liked the Beatles, but not as much as me. And it was like, occasionally I'd you know, be in the car and they'd say, Oh, could we put something else on? So, you know, then I'd put the Rolling Stones on. <laughs> something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I listened to the show that you guys did. I guess it was a year ago, was it? Something like that. Yeah, that's what I Which one? We've done several. Oh, about John Lennon. Yeah. yeah. The John Lennon one, yeah. <laughs> not the other 999 ones. So, if you don't mind, I'm just going to run through some of the stuff you said. And I just want to. Maybe talk about some psychological concepts, let's say. I should tell you, Kirk, that I've got a PhD in drugstore psychology. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. We call it coffee table, coffee table psychology in England. Yeah, yeah, it makes、um, sense. But first of all, can you just give me a couple of books and documentaries that you guys have watched? I know you've watched loads, but are there any that you kind of felt are the most accurate, or is that possible? Or are there too many? Well, I find that it's hard to find documentaries that I. Imagine get behind the scenes. Of course, the standard documentaries. I remember there was one big one in the 80s that I recorded off Channel 9, our, our public TV station here, and watch it over and over and over again. But it wasn't that long, if, if I recall. It was. It's probably Complete Beatles, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Complete、maybe. Beatles. Yeah. I, it was what, just a、yeah. few hours or something. And just then, a couple of hours, I think. Yeah. yeah, and then obviously the anthology that came out in the 90s. And、uh, yeah, that's what, 12 hours or something? That was 90s. Oh, okay.、Uh, I owned all、yeah. those VHS tapes, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I did too. And I remember watching that quite a bit and really liking that. Of course, and I wa- love those a lot and watch them and, and, and appreciate them, especially anthology, because they'll they have like the demo tapes. I just love demo record. I So just, what, two days ago, I had a glass of wine and I put on a demo tape of Maybe I'm Amazed by Paul, which is not John, mm. but and was playing on my piano just super loud, you know? So I was going through all these demo recordings of the Beatles and playing along with it. <laughs> like those old Let It Be recordings. I can't wait for that documentary to come out. That oh, it, September. It, yeah, directed by, what's his face, Australia? Pitch Jackson. Yeah. Pitch Jackson. Yeah. And mostly because I just gobble up anything, but... Also, I've heard that it kind of redeems the love between John and Paul and between all the members of the band. Because the narrative often, and I rail about this often if, you, if you're on the internet, and whenever Paul and Ringo are interviewed these days, it's, you know, one of the first three questions they get is, so like, what was all the anger going on? And wasn't Paul McCartney just such a prick, you know, and all this stuff? And it's such a simplistic way of looking at it. Like, everyone thinks John was this caustic, hipster, angry person, and Paul was this controlling narcissist, and things were way more nuanced than that. Nothing is, you know, that simple, right? Uh, John was quite jovial a lot of times, and Paul was quite subservient a lot of times, especially in the beginning of, of the Beatles. And so no documentary in my mind really gets at what I'm interested in my older age, which is the reality of the relationships. And I, I wonder if we'll ever be able to get that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing this, I guess I've been uh, accumulating knowledge, for want of a better phrase, for 30 years. And I started this podcast about a year and a bit ago. And the plot just thickens. I mean, my, obviously, it's mostly John, but I do branch off into Beatles. And the guy just gets more and more compelling, and the truth just gets more and more elusive. But basically, if I could sum it up, there's often this debate, which people call the Coleman-Goldman debate, because there was a book by a guy called Ray Coleman, and it was very much official version. John Lennon had a lot of problems, but he'd kind of resolved everything by 1980. And then there's this, have you heard of this book by Albert Goldman that came out in the 80s? I believe so. He wrote a book on Elvis, which all the Elvis fans were disgusted by. And then everybody heard he's going to write a book on John Lennon. and Everyone was fearing the worst. And it was as bad, you know. A few of the things have come out that seem to be perhaps a bit more accurate and that the official version is a bit too nice. But he, he just went off on, you know, like John Lennon and Brian Epstein were having an affair all the way through the band and these two kind of camps have emerged and in the last few years there's 1975 to 80 when he kind of retired for five years that's really the period where these two camps kind of split off one camp has him baking bread and madly in love with yoko another camp has him as this kind of wasted guy just sitting in bed getting stoned and stuff and you know the truth is probably in the middle as they as it normally is you know but um that's so incredible like like i was shocked when we did the episode about a lot of mm. the things that kirk had researched I mean, like, so, yeah, I watched the anthology stuff. I haven't watched that many visual documentaries. I I read, like I said, I read a lot. But in Mm -hmm. the last 20 years, a lot of what I read was more about how they recorded the music, not so much about their drama and stuff like that. But definitely what I had taken from all the books I read, all the stuff I had done, the image in my head was quite simply that John was a little bit more artsy, which I realize is, like, not accurate, right? But, like, he was a little more artsy. And... He was a little more opinionated, and Paul was a little more happy-go-lucky, and that when they had their break, it was really like, you know, John was just wanting to spend more time with Yoko, and that was really getting in the way. That was like the simplistic understanding I had, and I never really dug in too much deeper than that. So, yeah. Yeah, and when we did the episode, I probably spent a couple days researching as best I could online, trying to get credible accounts for what John was like behind the scenes. Because this is at a time of transition in the media where the media wasn't full-on TMZ style, right? People still wouldn't necessarily say things that would denigrate a famous person, and the media wouldn't necessarily print it. Today, everything that Kanye West does, we know about, because he tweets about it, one. But two, it's just like anyone who has dirt on Kanye is going to say it, right? So I tried to look up 
you know, tried to get credible information. And there were a lot of different accounts. And as you say, Anthony, that it leaves way more questions. But at least what I learned was that there's another story there that I had never really considered, namely, was John Lennon domestically violent? Did he commit mm-hmm. interpersonal violence on Cynthia, on Yoko, and uh, what's her face? May, May Pang. May, May Pang, Pang in, in mm-hmm. Los Angeles. And there are differing accounts. Some people say it was horrific and ongoing, and some people say it was not a big deal, and some people say that the sources are not credible. And so, you know, and like you say, it just raises more questions. And when we posted the episode, there was a lot of debate among people commenting of just like, oh, well, I heard this and I heard that. Mm-hmm. And it's just hard to know what really happened behind the scenes. Oh, all that, I used to be cruel to my woman and beat her. That's me, because I used to be cruel to my woman and physically. Okay. A- any woman, you know, I was a hitter. I couldn't express myself, and I, I hit, I fought men, I hit women, I was violent. That's why I'm always on about peace, you see. It's the most violent people that go for love and peace. And I sincerely believe in love and peace, but I am absolutely a violent man who has learned not to be violent and regrets his violence. John was very, very jealous and very possessive, and I think he actually said that later on in his life. I was aware of his jealousy, and I was aware... Not of his violence, because I hadn't seen his violence at that point. But, I mean, he didn't beat me up. I mean, he he just smacked me across the face, and I hit my head against the pipe in college. And at that point, I thought, well, I, I've never experienced this in my life, and I don't want to see it again. And I didn't. There'd been an awful lot of nurturing and looking after his delicate ego at that time and his pain. And I thought, well, you know, I can only go so far and no further. So uh, it took three months before he actually phoned me and we got back together again because I loved him, you know, it's as simple as that. It was an instant. It was something that he couldn't help and he didn't do it again. And I wouldn't have been with him if he had. In fact, that was the first and last time that he ever lifted a finger or a hand to me. So he learned his lesson. But I can say that my conclusion, based on the gestalt of all the information, was that John Lennon was relationally traumatized growing up. His first six years of life alone were, you know, unarguably difficult and lots of abandonment, neglect. And then his mom dies tragically and violently when he's a teenager and he's completely alone at that point. And so... He definitely had relational traumas that, per, that led to personality effects, possibly depression, ongoing depression or p- periodic depression that most likely showed up in his relationships. The degree to which it happened, hard to know, but it was at least to some degree. Yeah, I think what I've concluded from, because I've actually managed to have on my show people who were like in bands with him. I've had two of the quarry men, which is absolutely amazing. And I had his personal assistant, a guy who lived with him for a couple of years in the 70s. And I mean, even they don't agree on everything. But I think the conclusion I've reached is that John Lennon, when drunk, was a very different animal to John Lennon sober. I mean, perhaps you can tell me... Do you think alcohol more than any other drug brings out these demons? Because some of the stories of him when he, from May Pang... When he got drunk, I mean, he just went to the depths of just dark shit, you know, just awful. Yeah, well, it's hard Mm. to say, and alcohol has different effects on different people, but we can all, Mm. at least anecdotally, and research points to this, stories of people when they drink, they will become, quote-unquote, a different person, Mm. violent, aggressive, unreasonable, fixated on negativity, these kinds of things. He did on the odd occasion have a few altercations with other people in his life when he couldn't help it and it was to do with booze at the time he could not take his drink i was pretty self-destructive at college too when i was art school in liverpool you know it was mainly a one long drinking session i remember at college i always got a little violent on drink i used to have a friend called jeff mohammed rest his soul who died he was a half Indian Arab who was my friend at art school. He would be like a bodyguard for me, so whenever I'd get into some controversy, he would sort of ease me out of it. But I do recall at college punching through telephone box glass, you see. I don't like that waking up and thinking, what happened? Did I kill somebody? Given his relational traumas and given 
how I think ongoing he felt alone. I think he felt deeply alone almost all sure. the time. And, and that's why when Yoko Ona came along and for whatever reason they clicked, he really glommed onto that at the expense of all of his other relationships. And one could say it's a beautiful thing to people fall in love, but another would say that he was putting all of his eggs in this basket that ultimately actually didn't pan out. I mean, within a few years, he was having lots of problems with Yoko. And there's, it's a famous event where he goes to LA and he's with Nielsen. What's his name? Harry Nielsen. Harry Nielsen, yeah. And Harry uh, Nielsen. drinking nonstop at uh, the Troubadour, I believe they're hanging out in. And that was when the famous event that, was it Harry Nielsen that witnessed the the violence? between him and May Peng, uh, someone witnessed yeah, it. Yeah, among various people. There was a couple of Apple people there as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, where John just lunged for May Peng and seemingly tried to kill her right in front of other people, tried to strangle her to death and had to be pulled off of her. Now, how much of that was chalked up to alcohol intoxication? You know, some people say, well, it brings out what's underneath. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, if anyone has ever been really drunk, you can attest to the fact that you'll do things when you're really drunk that are really not anything that you ever thought about. Your brain is basically dysfunctioning at that state. And so certainly that's possible. But, you know, he had a lot of reasons to be angry. I mean, there, there were just a lot of built up anger for very legitimate reasons going back to his childhood. Do you guys probably know the story that his father took him off to Blackpool and his mother arrived and he was forced to choose between the two of them? Now, there's this guy called Mark Lewison who's a kind of acknowledged Beatles brain of the world and he is an incredible researcher. He does it full time. He's disputed that, but there's no dispute that he lost his uncle when he was 14. He lost his mother when he was 17. He lost Stuart Sutcliffe when Stuart was 21. I guess John was 21. You know, it's a lot of loss. But I mean, do you guys, you were talking about the lost weekend, but do you know, even as early as 63, which is when the Beatles were the cuddly mop tops, at Paul McCartney's 21st birthday, there was a DJ from the cavern who was uh, taunting John Lennon, because John Lennon went on holiday with Brian Epstein. I guess maybe you know that story as well, this famous Spanish holiday. And this guy said to John Lennon, oh, what happened between you and Brian then? And John Lennon went absolutely mental and from some accounts, started beating this guy to death. Oh, my God. You know, and this is 1963. But, of course, nobody wanted to, like, stop the Beatles train. So it was all covered up. The Beatles' first national coverage was me beating up Bob Wooler at <laughs> Paul's 21st party because he intimated I was homosexual. So I must have had a fear that maybe I was a homosexual to attack him like that. And it's very complicated reasoning. But I was very drunk and I hit him. And I could have really killed somebody then. And that scared me. I was like, Paul was 21, so I must have been 23 then. And that was in the Daily Mirror. It was the back page. I remember the picture. It was pretty scary. And it was a kind of rehash of my youth. So it was a kind of self-destructive suicide side of me, which is resolving itself. All the sex was covered up. You know, these orgies on, on tour, the drugs were covered up because the press and everyone wanted to keep the party going, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm all for the orgies and stuff. The beatings. <laughs> but not be, the beating. You know, we could ease up on the beatings a little bit. I mean, yeah. so, you know what I did? I think I talked about it in the episode. Is I mm. did get this graphic novel that is about Brian Epstein. Um, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know if you've seen it. Uh, it's really beautiful. And I learned a lot about his story. I, I, I don't know how exactly accurate it all is, but just from that book, it was really interesting. This dynamic between him and John that was not as well known. Yeah, it was kind of strange. There's a really good film called The Hours and Times. It's a kind of art arty kind of film. But I mean, it's not really based in fact. It's very speculative, but it's, it's brilliantly done. It's got some lovely Spanish flamenco music. Because they had this holiday in Spain and nobody's quite sure exactly what happened. But um, Yeah. The graphic novel in question is called The Fifth Beetle. When did that come out? Is it fairly um, recent? 2013, but I got it recently. Huh. So I guess it was a while ago. I, I think I read it last year. All right. Now, Kirk, when you did your show, now you said quite rightly, you know, you didn't want to diagnose John Lennon, you know, 40 years after the fact and having never met him. But the thing that you mentioned was borderline personality disorder. Can you just explain that for my listeners? Yeah. So there's a lot of misconception on the Internet. So if you Google it, you're probably going to get 
at least half, if not full, misinformation about what borderline is. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is that when you're relationally traumatized and when you're parented in a way that's fairly inconsistent, meaning that you get some love just some of the time and most of the time you're being neglected, the child is forced to develop a coping style for that. And one coping style that's available to young children, we're talking two, three years old, is to amp up your signaling for attachment needs, meaning that when you're hurt a little bit, you feel the hurt tremendously. This is all unconscious. It's not like the two-year-old makes this a conscious choice. And it's a neuronal experience. It's not sort of a style of living. It's something that affects your brain development. The child will feel the hurt times 10, and then they signal times 10. So if you were to leave the child alone in a room for a little bit of time, they will very quickly say they're upset about that and they will scream and scream and scream until you come back to them. And then after you come back to them, they will still want to punish you for 10 times longer than an a kid who's securely attached would want to punish you for that. So we can imagine a young child being that way. And that translates as a teenager and an adult, as someone who is quote unquote needy, who's dramatic, who overreacts a lot, who can be very clingy, but also very rejecting, can idealize relationships, sort of black and white in terms of the way you see relationships. It's like, you're all good or you're all bad. And when you encounter people like this, you'll feel like, oh my God, this person really likes me. And then all of a sudden you have done something which you consider to be quite small and they feel very betrayed and will treat you as if you did something, the worst thing you, any human could have ever done to you. But the reason is, is because neurologically, the individual developed this you know, reality and this, this physiology that needed to amp up their noticing of abandonment and react tenfold so that there would be a greater likelihood of them getting their needs met growing up. You know, we all know that John grew up with his mom not being so great. She wasn't ready to be a mom. The father also didn't seem that ready. At the very least, there's a lot of conflict. And then, you know, he is raised by his aunt and there's accounts that his aunt and uncle were, you know, stable, but possibly not super enthusiastic about raising someone else's kid. Hard to know, of course, but you know, there's just a lot of suspicion there. At the very least, he has the profile of a kid who would develop borderline personality or, or some cluster B personality. Narcissism is similar to borderline. And right. so then we look at his behavior and the accounts of it. Again, if you look at all the accounts, there's a lot of smoke. So there's probably a fire there, right? We don't know which yeah. <laughs> which of the accounts are accurate, how much of it is accurate, but there's a lot of vectors pointing towards something that that he was overreactive, feeling bad. So another thing that happens for borderline people is because of the abandonment they went through when they were young, they just have a deep sense that they are worthless. And this can be very yeah. depressing to them. It's a depressing notion to walk around with. And so they can have quote unquote depression, but really it stems from their borderline injuries. And there's lots of accounts of John wanting to sleep all the time and, you know, having a hard time getting motivated sometimes. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that they're attracted to substances because of how much suffering they're going through when they take substances, particularly things like heroin, for the first mm -hmm. time in their life, they don't feel that suffering anymore. People with borderline past a certain threshold are in a constant state of suffering. It's just a constant nagging emotional pain that they're going through. And it's visceral. It's not just like intellectual. It's a very terrible experience. And so there's a lot of things pointing at the relational trauma syndrome that a lot of people yeah. develop. Obviously, like you said, I can't diagnose them. I have no idea. But I try to educate the listeners so that they can maybe look to their own lives so that they might have more awareness for themselves. Yeah, I mean, that was my point. I mean, I was thinking about that. So many people connect with John Lennon that maybe they will connect with his issues. And I'll make it clear in my introduction that we're speculating, certainly not making diagnoses. Have you heard of a guy called Gabor Mate? He's, he, he's yes, that rings internet. a bell. Yeah, that rings a I, bell. I don't think I have. Yeah, he's a, I think he's Hungarian-American. He worked with, I think, drug addicts in Vancouver, if I got it right. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend you have a look at his stuff. I mean, there's tons of it online. And 
he kind of said the same thing to you, as you did because when when you did your show, you said that heroin is not so much an addiction. I think I've got an attachment psychic pain problem, and he said that one of his patients said to him that heroin was like a warm hug, and the patient has said to Gabo Mate, "It's like the first time this was like receiving the first hug I'd ever received." You know, the heroin because, yeah. like you said, it just soothed. It was the first time they'd ever felt free That's of this so stress. Sad. I know, it's so sad, it brought tears to my eyes when he was talking about it's it. It's crazy. It's interesting to see or to ask who becomes addicted. People can have sex without being addicted to it, they can go shopping, but some people become severely addicted to all these pursuits. If I speak to a group of 100 people or 1,000 people and I ask, well, how many of you have addiction issues and to any substance? A number of people put their hand up and I say, what did it do for you? Not what was bad about it, we already know that, but what did it do for you? What was positive in your experience of it? Well, it gave me a sense of peace. It gave me uh, pain relief. It made me feel more connected. It made me more confident. I could speak now and interact with other people. In other words, the addict is just after wanting to be a normal human being. And the real question is what keeps them from having those qualities in their lives and what happened to them? And so that the addiction should be seen not as the problem, although it is a problem, but it's not the problem, it's the addict's attempt to solve a problem in the first place. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies, done in California, looked at conditions such as physical, sexual, and emotional abuse in a child's life, the loss of a parent through death, or a rancorous divorce, or a parent being jailed, or a mental illness in the parent, or addiction in the parent, or violence in the family. And for each of these adverse childhood experiences, the risk of addiction goes up exponentially. By the time a male child has had six of these adverse experiences, his risk of having become a substance dependent, injection using addict, is 4,600% greater than that of a male child with no such experiences. Why is that? It's because that trauma shapes the brain in such ways as to make the addictive substances more appealing to the individual. That trauma also gives that person the pain that they will try to then escape from or, or to soothe through the addictive behaviors, which then brings us to the war on drugs. Basically, the war on drugs is being waged against people that were abused and traumatized in children and have mental health problems. There's enough punishment in there in the negative consequences of the addiction that we don't have to add punishment onto that. All the substances of abuse, whether they're opiates or cocaine or anything else, they're actually painkillers. Some of them specifically are painkillers. But physical pain and emotional pain, the suffering is experienced in the same part of the brain. So when people suffer emotional rejection, the same part of the brain will light up as if you stuck them with a knife. The Neckhart Tolle says very nicely that addictions begin with pain and end with pain. So when I work with addictions, the first question is always not why the addiction, but why the pain. And uh, what you find is emotional loss or trauma. In the case of the severe addicts, as in the downtown insider, there were every single one of them traumatized. But you know, whether it's a sex addiction or internet or, or, or um, relationship or shopping or work addiction, these are all attempts to get away from distress. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stone guitarist, who used to have a severe heroin habit, as you know, he said that all the contortions we go through just not to be ourselves for a few hours. Well, the Tibetan book of living and dying, uh, it's got a wonderful line in it. Whatever you do, don't try and escape from your pain, but be with it. But the question is, how can people be with their pain? Well, only if they sense some compassion. So as another teacher says, only when compassion is present will people allow themselves to see the truth. So. Addicted people need a, a compassionate present which will permit them to experience their pain without having to run away from it. And, and we live in a society that, one way or the other, is always about instant relief, quick satisfaction, distraction. In other words, we live in a culture that is based on, both economically and, and psychologically, not uh, supporting people to be with themselves. So it's always the quick getaway. So it's very difficult to deal with addictions in a society. But yeah, it is a matter of, at some point, finding a way of being with your pain so that you can actually get to know what it's really all about. So the opiate addict is somebody who's got too much pain, not enough pleasure and reward in their life, and not enough love in their life. As a sex trade worker said to me, and I quote her in the book, 
She said, the first time I did heroin, it felt like a warm, soft hug. And that's the power. The power of the opiate addiction is that it gives you three qualities without which life is unlivable. And, and if your brain was deprived of the conditions that promote the healthy development of the endorphin circuits, you might be a sitting duck for heroin addiction because when you get the heroin, you feel normal for the first time in your life. Yeah. But I've heard that before. Where did I hear this before? Well, it, there's a lot more awareness. We emerged out of the 80s and 90s with this just say no stuff and this yeah. demonizing of people who use substances and people who struggle yeah. with the substances. And we're just now like 1% movement of understanding that it's often with substance abuse, a result of deep psychic suffering that the substances ameliorate on some level, but obviously come with a bunch of negative side effects. And yeah, plenty of people, maybe even listening right now, can attest to the common experience is someone was relationally traumatized growing up. They have ongoing pain, psychic pain. They might normalize it over time. They might think, well, maybe everyone feels this way. I don't know. Because it's just this ongoing you know, trouble that they experience. And then they get yeah. their wisdom teeth pulled out or they have some kind of medical procedure and they're prescribed opiates or opioids. And they take their Percocet, they take, you know, the Vicodin or something as prescribed. And all of a sudden, for the very first time, they feel normal. They feel like that feeling when the water in your ear finally, you know, wow. pops Please. and for, and all of a sudden uh, now, you yeah. can, now you can hear again. That's what it feels like for those people. And you can't blame them for saying, where can I get more of these? And I mean, I don't know how much you guys know about the extent of the drugs that John Lennon did, but you know, again, it's hard to know. He said, he famously said in an interview, I did a thousand trips, which is maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but we have it on good evidence that he was, when he wasn't needed for Beatles recording sessions after they finished touring, he was pretty much tripping every day for pretty much a year, you know, and, journalists would come around and he, and he wouldn't know i mean he'd wake up like you said kirk sleeping a lot he'd wake up at like four in the afternoon he wouldn't know what time it was he wouldn't know what day it was literally i mean maybe he just didn't want to know what day it was it's fine he didn't have to get up for work or anything but and then you know the late 60s there was coke there was heroin as you know and obviously weed so uh do those drugs act together or do they have separate effects i mean well it's hard to know and they react differently mm. for different people but uh, psychedelics typically work on a serotonin system which is the same system that prozac and antidepressants work on now mm. we have very little understanding of the brain anyway we actually don't really understand why ssris or prozac work on people but we do know that serotonin does have something to do with motivation and depression and anxiety and mood and energy level and so it always has stood to reason that to me taking lsd and mushrooms if you're depressed would actually improve your mood on some level it was the most peaceful joyous incredible life-changing experience i've ever had in my life there were scary parts foreboding parts i always knew there was beautiful and joy and peace on the other side of it it was freeing. It was really freeing. This is Alana. She's describing what she felt after she took a dose of this stuff, psilocybin. It's a naturally occurring psychedelic compound, the kind that you find in magic mushrooms. But she wasn't tripping in a dorm room or at Woodstock. It actually wasn't recreational at all. It was part of a controlled medical test to see if psychedelics could be useful in helping people quit cigarettes. Alana had been smoking for 37 years before her session with psilocybin, and she hasn't had a cigarette since. Research on psychedelics for medical use is preliminary. Most studies suffer from really small sample sizes, and that's partly because the federal government lists LSD and psilocybin as Schedule 1 drugs. So researchers face extra red tape, and funding is really hard to come by. Vox writer Herman Lopez reviewed dozens of studies that have been done, and he found that psychedelics show promise for treating addiction, OCD, anxiety, and in some cases, depression. In a pilot study of 12 advanced cancer patients suffering from end-of-life anxiety, participants who took psilocybin generally showed lower scores on a test of depression. And a smaller study suggested that psilocybin treatment could actually help people with alcohol dependence cut back on their drinking days. 
We don't have all the answers as to what exactly these treatments are doing in the brain, but they seem to work by providing a meaningful and even mystical experience that leads to lasting changes in a patient's life. Marijuana has a totally different physiological effect, and for a lot of people, they will report that it just kind of mellows them out, right? It's just like, okay, it takes the edge off, and mm -hmm. they stop feeling the sort of negative feelings they were feeling before. Having said that, for some people, it increases their anxiety as well and can make you more depressed if you use it ongoing. So like I said, these substances can have both effects. Like for coffee, for example, some people drink coffee, they get energy. Some people drink coffee, they get tired. So it really yeah. depends on the individual. But what I will see is that people with relational traumas will tend to take a lot of substances they won't just take one substance. They'll take a lot of different substances because, again, mm -hmm. they're desperately trying to tamp down the horrific abyss that they feel when they're sober. When they're sober and they're alone and they're just staring into themselves, they see a giant abyss of worthlessness and nothingness. And you'll even hear people say that they feel empty on the inside. And that is a terrifying experience for people that if there's a substance to cover that up, then they're going to try to take it. Another interesting thing that this personal assistant, this guy was a personal assistant of John Lennon for the last two years of his life. He said that John Lennon always had like a quote, an electronic buzz going. He would sit in his room and he'd have books strewn open. And he'd have the radio on. He was a real media junkie. And uh, he liked to have this constant electronic buzz going and you know, the TV would be on with the sound off or very low and the radio would be on and, and he'd be reading he'd have his reading material strewn about he was uh, very knowledgeable about all kinds of subjects scientific subjects uh, history ancient history uh, archaeology he liked to have his attention focused on different things at once because he had a very active mind and this guy said uh, he felt like john lennon was maybe a little bit afraid of silence which i know contradicts the meditation and everything but that kind of struck home to me this need because i've kind of i kind of done it myself a lot this need if you've constantly got the tv going and the radio going and magazines going and your mind constantly occupied you don't have to face the abyss does that make any sense or is that is that real wow. drugstore psychology <laughs> Like yeah. Looking into the abyss and seeing it staring back at you. Yeah. Well, you know, just, just that thing of not really wanting silence because then you've got to kind of face your own shit, you know. But if you can keep putting it off with constant activity, you can kind of keep it at bay, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to pathologize mm. that because there's mm. potentially a lot of different reasons why someone would always have the TV on or be really active. I mean, hyperactivity, ADHD could also be at play, maybe even for John as well, hard to know. Just a, a general need for stimulation, a general boredom. Uh, Umberto and I are certainly like this. We probably look like John Lennon sometimes to outsiders. Uh, just constant things. I mean, I, I, would, I just took a look around my room and I, I have three books that I'm half, <laughs> half reading and I got my piano. Shit, I didn't sitting. mean to diagnose you, Cook. <laughs> yeah. um, and so being a little high energy could, and John Lennon seemed to have that when he was awake at the same time, like you say, Anthony, he was full of <laughs> contradictions. He was also sleeping all the time. It certainly could be part of that. You know, I'd be yeah. curious if John ever spoke to that. And I seem to remember that toward the end of his life, short life, which is so weird to think about. He died a lot younger than we are now. I don't know how old yeah, you are, right? Anthony, but... I'm 44. Yeah, so we're in our 40s, and so he didn't live as long as we... It's just such a weird Well, thought. and what was bizarre to me about that, parentheses, parentheses, was that when I was, you know, in my late teens and then early 20s, whenever I would see their pictures, their latter years, you know, they have their beards and their hats and their long hair, and I always thought of that as like, oh, yeah, that's when they were old, right? And I also had this image in my head that from the time they started, like let's say 62 till yeah. 70, I didn't think of that as like seven, eight years, right? Oh. Like I thought of that as decades. Yeah, so 20 me, years. John Lennon <laughs> lived a long life and was old and had the beard and the long hair. And yeah. then he got shot. That's when I was like in my early 20s. Yeah. And then now I'm like, oh my God, he was a baby.
Well, one of my guests came up with the term Beatle years because they had so much stimulation that one Beatle year was like the equivalent of five years for us. <laughs> yeah, and their output, right? Like, oh, God, God, their output. I mean, in those days, it was kind of expected. I mean, someone like, uh, let's say, Radiohead, for example, who I'm a big fan of, they'll take five years to do an album. But in those days, it was just like three months. <laughs> Absolutely, no, just, that, it was, that it was expected mm. that they would be cranking out things. But the fact that mm. it wasn't that just they were putting out content. It was like hit, 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 hit. Number one, <laughs> yeah. number one, number one. Oh, my God. And every and I mean, album is a progression forward that's very clear. I mean, you could argue oh. that some of the early albums are not you know, super obvious in terms of their progression. But, you know, the progression from Help to Rubber Soul to Revolver mm. to Sgt. Pepper, you know, to the albums beyond that, it's like each album is like another decade of culture. Yeah. You know the red and blue? You know they recreated the album cover? You right. know, it's like they're, they're leaning over the same balcony. Right. Right. That's six years, in fact. The first one's beginning of 63. Crazy. It's beginning. And so, someone put a meme, meme on the internet. The red is the Beatles before the coronavirus, and the blue is the Beatles <laughs> after. Yes. And, uh, and that's the only mention I'm going to make of the coronavirus, because my podcast is going to stand as a kind of a break from that, you know? Yay. <laughs> but can I ask, um, I want to ask both of you guys, what's the effect of fame on... Um, someone like John Lennon or, you know, because you know all these people, the 27 Club, Jimi Hendrix, Janice... How much do you think fame contributed to their demise? Again, just speculating. Berto? Go so on, to me, there is a constant set of examples where people don't handle fame well. And it's not surprising, mm. right? Because when did anyone get a chance to evolve the modern concept of fame? Like if you were famous in the olden times, like 1,000, mm. 2,000, 3,000 years ago, first of all, you could count on one finger maybe two fingers, the number of people that were actually famous massively, right? And even then, it wasn't like a well-known fame. Because think about like, oh my gosh, Julius Caesar. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Had you ever actually seen him? you never seen a picture of him. Did you ever yeah. see him in real life? Or was it just more like someone you'd heard of, right? So this concept of modern fame where your picture is everywhere, where everyone's hearing your words and seeing your video, there's see like hundreds and hundreds gathered throughout the world because you go on a world tour, never existed. So how on earth is a human supposed to deal with that in the first place? And let alone if they had trauma, which is part of the reason why they're so famous because they were narcissistic enough to do that in the first place. And then, yeah. and then they start at a young age and then you see it worse when they're really, really young. Oh, so, yeah, I, I do believe that that plays a role. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, we certainly can point to a lot of profiles of individuals, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, mm. these sorts of people who seem to have fizzled out early because of fame. And if they weren't famous, mm. you wonder, would they have lived longer to heal from their past issues to survive a lot longer or if their fame was lesser than it than it was if plenty of people die young due to issues of suicide or overdose all the time and some of them happen to be famous so it's hard to know but we did a deep dive on amy winehouse and the thing that i really uh -huh. learned about her was that she also had relational traumas growing up that were pretty obvious and she would i think speak openly about them so one of the things that all of us have potential for, but particularly some personalities who were traumatized growing up, they will depend on accolades from other people to validate themselves. And it's not as if they wake up in the morning, they want to be shallow, quote unquote. It's that they don't trust other people to actually love them for who they are at their core. They believe through, you know, reinforcement at the age of two, three, four, that the only way they're going to get love, true love, is this sort of fake conditional love on them being stars, on them being interesting, on them being compelling in some way. And so they have a talent, God-given talent as well, and these two things match up together, and they have this sort of cascade effect where they get five fans, and they're like, oh my God, I had zero fans yesterday, and now I have five. I feel validated as a human being. Well, a week of having five fans, eventually like, well, now I don't feel that feeling anymore. It's, we call it this narcissistic supply. And then you need 10 fans and then you need 20 fans and you need 200 fans. And there's this ever, you know, moving treadmill of it has to be going up. And at some point, 
it's not going to be going up anymore because there's just only so many humans on the planet. And I think that for someone like Amy Winehouse, and I, and I think maybe for John Lennon as well, eventually you sort of peak and the accolades start you know, slowing down or you start plateauing or something like that. And then you're kind of left there wondering, well, who am I? Now I have to face... Who am I as a human being? Do do people really love me? You know, Nowhere Man by John Lennon, where he talks about, you know, everyone loves me, but yet I feel like I'm nothing. You know, that emptiness that you feel on the inside. And without any guide, like a therapist who specializes in personality disorders, for example, you're just left to believe that you are empty and that there is something deeply wrong with you. And then you start to get really desperate and there's nowhere to go, right? Because you can't get back that initial... Beatlemania hump that you get in 1964, 1965. So now you have to face yourself and you're also on the decline in a certain way, you know, in terms of your accolades. And that's when people's stress really starts to spike, you know. Yeah. And what you said earlier about the issues of being, I guess you were saying you're very sensitive to slights. So I guess bad reviews and things like that, they would probably take them a lot worse. Right. The intense desire for fame probably has its roots in the experience of neglect, in injury. No one would want to be famous who hadn't also somewhere in the past been made to feel extremely insignificant. Perhaps one's parents were hard to impress. That's why one dreams that one day the world will pay attention. Or maybe our parents were great, but it was the wider world, starting with the schoolyard, that was intolerable after early years of adulation at home. And yet, there's a problem. Fame cannot really accomplish what is asked of it. Every new famous person who disintegrates, breaks down in public, or loses their mind is judged in isolation rather than being interpreted as a victim of an inevitable pattern within the pathology of fame. You want to be famous because you want people to like you. But the world isn't generally kind to the famous for very long, and the reason is basic. The success of any one person involves humiliation for lots of others. The celebrity of a few people will always contrast painfully with the obscurity of the many. Being famous upsets people. When we imagine fame, we forget that it's inextricably connected to being too visible in the eyes of some people, to bugging them unduly, to coming to be seen as the plausible cause of their humiliation, a symbol of how the world has treated them unfairly. Fame makes people more, not less vulnerable, because it throws them open to unlimited judgment. Everyone is wounded by a cruel assessment of their character or merit, but the famous have an added challenge in store. The assessments will come in from legions of people who would never dare to say to their faces what they can now express from the safety of the newspaper office or the screen. We know from our own lives that a nasty remark can take a day or two to process. Social media hasn't helped. It's made it far easier than before to be famous, and therefore, by necessity, far easier to be hated. A minor celebrity can now regularly face all the vitriol previously accorded only to Hollywood stars. Psychologically, the famous are, of course, the very last people on earth to be well-equipped to deal with what they're going through. After all, they only became famous because they were wounded, because they had thin skin, because they were, in some respects, a bit ill. And now, far from compensating them adequately for their disease, fame aggravates it exponentially. Strangers voice their negative opinions in detail, unable or simply unwilling to imagine that famous people bleed far more quickly than anyone else. They might even think the famous aren't listening, though one wouldn't become famous if one didn't suffer from a compulsion to listen too much. Every worse fear about oneself, that one's stupid, ugly, not worthy of existence, will daily be confirmed by strangers. One will be exposed to the fact that people one's never met, about whom one would have only goodwill, actively loathe one. One will learn that detestation of one's personality is, in some quarters, a badge of honour. Sometimes the attacks will be horribly insightful. At other times, they'll make no sense to anyone who really knows one. But the criticisms will lodge in people's minds nevertheless, and no lawyer, court case, or magician will ever be able to delete them. I guess you saw the Amy documentary from a few years ago, did you? Yes, I did. That was Netflix, wasn't it? I mean, with her, it's incredible. There's an interview. She brought out two albums, I think. The first album was called Frank. There's an interview with a guy called Jonathan Ross, who's quite popular here in England. And she's on this interview, and she's, she was actually quite chubby in a kind of healthy way. She looks very full in the face. But the difference in 
I mean, two years. Uh, there's a panel show called Never Mind the Buzzcocks, and she appeared on that famously. She's just so thin, and and there's just there's no life in her eyes, you know. Kind of like Sid Barrett, you know, the original Pink Floyd guy. Yeah, so I guess it's just the fame just kind of exacerbates what's already there. Yeah, you and know. your manager, for this is more true for Amy Winehouse, is dependent on you cranking out your product and getting lots of income because the manager gets 10, 15% of everything. But the manager gets to go home at night and sleep well. Whereas the yeah. people like, you know, if you've ever performed Anthony, I mean, uh, Merido and I can certainly attest to this. The whole process of gearing up to be on stage, being on stage, winding down from being on stage is a very emotionally draining experience that definitely. will indefinitely throw off your sleep schedule and will definitely make it attractive to start using substances to control that circadian rhythm disruption. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, I could go on and on about that because when I first started seriously playing out in a band, I overdid it as far as how many shows we would book. I had the wrong idea about it. In my mind, I was like, well, the, the more shows we play, you know, they're going to get more momentum. And I didn't really think of it in terms of like how many people showed up. So we were booking like three or four shows a week. They were in like all over the place. No one showed up and stuff, but it was brutal, like constant going, traveling, taking all your stuff. And every yeah. single show, because I was so excited that I was playing out, you know, we'd end late because not only would the show end late anyways, but then you got to like unload all your gear, everything like Kirk is saying, and then you want to celebrate. So we'd go like for a late dinner and man, this was like very taxing. I was a lot younger then, but still. And that's nothing compared to like a true tour, you know? Yeah. Or like these, when they were actually like playing nonstop in Hamburg or something like that, you know, like that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Amy was begging to not tour or to slow down. And the mm -hmm. people around her just kept pushing her. And because of her relational trauma, she didn't have the internal resources to s say no. And probably also was chasing that narcissistic dragon of validation from the crowds and that just drove her into using more and more substances sometimes on stage she was just like completely hammered because of the physiological toll that these sorts of lifestyles take on the individual it's just awful just awful i wish that every famous person had this personal assistant who understood this and like advocated yeah. for them and was just like nope this is too much touring you can't do this to a human being yeah or kind of like a like a personal uh, i don't know life coach or something but someone who's not dependent on them right and that's what doing, the manager is supposed to be right the manager is supposed to yeah. be that person but if they have an incentive to drive the amy winehouses into the ground for their own financial gain then who is going to advocate for the amy winehouses yeah there's that awful bit in the documentary where she, she's trying to clean up she goes to i think it's an award ceremony and you hear her say oh mike this is so boring without drugs oh my god really? mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was awful yeah. and i mean the thing about the touring as well i don't know how much you know about bob dylan but Dylan as well. I mean, from 63 to 66, I mean, his physical appearance, the change, I mean, how thin yeah. and pale he got. And 66, when he made Blonde and Blonde, I mean, he looked like shit. And a lot of people think, actually, the, you know, the famous motorbike accident may have even been faked. Or there's lots of speculation about it with some sort of subconscious thing. But, I mean, his manager, Albert Grossman, was pretty ruthless. He was known for being pretty ruthless. But they had, like, 40 shows booked or something. Michael Jackson as well, actually. They, yeah. they put me wow. 40 shows in 45 days. Or right. Uh, yes. You know, Prince, I don't know the details, all the details, but certainly mm. one could argue that his schedule was, you know, not helpful to his health. John Lennon yeah. was one of the first people to start to show cracks in his psychology as just the touring went on, the meaninglessness of being in front of tens of thousands of people just screaming while they can't even hear him. And he's just on stage, just losing his mind, you know, because I mean, of, they made a very conscious and controversial decision to stop touring. Right. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, like, who, like if they had been anyone else, who would have let them like not tour? Right. right. They just had yeah. the power in their case to be like, nope, we're just going to make albums. <laughs> yeah. Because it's of the, the, the mental health hurt. issues. Now, Paul right. McCartney was willing to keep going and always wanted and then did when as soon as he could return to that and has consistently toured post Beatles and because he was not relationally traumatized and has a greater ability to 
advocate for himself and have balance in his life and feel okay in the face of criticism or whatever. Whereas for John Lennon, because of his relational traumas growing up, it was much harder for him to cope with that. So Anthony, we're running out of time. I feel, I looked, I just looked at the clock and I was like, Oh my God, it feels, (laughs) I feel like it's only been like 20 minutes, but uh, we have to wrap up here because we both have appointments. So any I'd love to do a follow up if if you guys want to at some point. Yeah. I can always talk more about Beatles. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Another five hours only. (laughs) Yeah. Have you got like a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. We'll do a wrap up. All right. Yeah, so uh, what do you think? I mean, this is just for fun, not, not in your professional capacity, but what, what do you think John Lennon would have done had he lived past 1980? Just as a fan, what do you... Yeah, Berto. Do you think he would have survived, first of all? You know, Would he have survived? <laughs> if he was still fame, alive, so. like in, uh, what was that movie recently? <laughs> oh, Where yesterday, yeah. Robert yes, Carlyle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was Robert Carlyle? Yeah. I guess was, yeah. I didn't catch that at the time. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. insane. All right, yeah. I actually feel I would love it. Oh my gosh. The world would be so benefited if he was still around, if he had kept going in the trajectory that he was going in creatively. Just imagine the voice he could be right now, the songs he could put out, the like messages he could be driving. I just think it'd be so powerful. Maybe, I'm hoping. You know, because like Paul, and I love Paul. I think he's such an amazing musician. I, I modeled my bass playing after him. But if I'm being honest, like, Musically, I stopped caring about his new music a long, long time ago. Whereas yeah, I, I feel, feel like that like, with the Stones as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I feel Sorry, like go, I go. would have still loved some stuff from John. You know, but, yeah, it's hard to yeah. say because you wonder well, there was got to be someone analogous to him that survived into the different eras of our society. But there's really no one like John Lennon that you could say, oh, he probably would have had a similar life to so and so. Uh, I mean, can you think of anyone that, who was like John Lennon that we could compare him to? Maybe Kurt Cobain had some similarities, but not really. Not from the time. Maybe yeah. Bob Dylan and Berto, yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. Bob Dylan, although I see the comparison, John Lennon was way more outspoken and way, way more, more sort of erratic, I guess, and, and when, just and more than hard Kurt on Cobain his sleeve too. kind of his thing. But Kurt Cobain died young too. So, yeah. But what would Kurt Cobain look like at, at age 50 right now? You know, What would he yeah. be doing? It's just so hard to know, but you got to know that he would have been saying things and doing things and being in the press and going on shows and being interviewed and a force for good. I, I very much imagine that. Would he also be saying a bunch of ridiculous things that all of us would kind of get? Probably Kanye West is probably a good example of right. like what he would, you know, the tweets that would probably be coming from John Lennon would be like yeah. fantastical. Like John, I could just see John Lennon saying like, will someone please kill Donald Trump, please? You know, I could just imagine. And then he has to pull back his, his tweet or, you know, you could just imagine these erratic Twitter storm experiences from John Lennon. That that would probably be the closest person I could think of. That's so funny you said that because we've just been saying that on some recent shows. He would have spent so much time apologizing <laughs> for lashing out at people. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right. All right, yeah. guys. Thank you very much. It's been great all right, to awesome. have you on the show. Yeah. Can you just give me the, quickly give us the, the link for your show. Are you on all the main platforms? Yep. All the main platforms. Yeah. Psychology in Seattle. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. All the thank best. You. Thank See you. Thank you. All right. Bye. So there you have it. That was Kirk Honda and Umberto Castaneda and me talking about John Lennon's psychology. Obviously, we didn't get to cover everything about John Lennon's psychology. It's too complex. But really, as we mentioned, there seem to be more questions than answers. And perhaps further probing will just bring up more questions and more frustrations. Anyway, thanks again to Kirk and Umberto for being on the show. And their podcast is Psychology in Seattle. Highly recommended. There was just one other thing regarding this conversation. I noticed when I was editing it, I edited it very carefully, by the way, and I added all those audio clips. So I really wanted to get a nice product, for want of a better word, out there. But um, I took out a couple of factual errors, and this is an issue that Gordon Rochford brought up right at the beginning of his appearance on the show about um, Beatles fans sometimes nitpicking. And it's funny that when Kirk and Umberto did their original John Lennon show, Kirk said at some point, during the conversation, I bet there's John Lennon fans picking me up on little factual inaccuracies. So there were a couple that I left in just purely because they were in the middle of the flow of conversation. I don't want to make too many mechanical edits just for the sake of it. But, you know, the hardcore Beatle heads just accept that, you know, every now and again, 
there might be a slight inaccuracy. Anyway, so the next show is going to be with Chip Maddinger and Mark Easter. Chip actually contacted me, which I was very flattered about. And they're talking about the reissue of their book, Eight Arms to Hold You. And obviously with the John Lennon thing, we talk about John Lennon's solo career more than the other Beatles, but all via this book. Chip Madigan also has a book called Lennonology that I haven't read yet, but I'll get to that and perhaps have him on the show again in the future. But on that subject, after this Sunday, I will have the next 10 to 11 weeks covered. And, you know, it might even be a longer time frame than that if I don't put them out weekly, although I probably will do more or less weekly anyway. So, yeah, just really remains for me to say thank you very much for listening. And please, please, please subscribe both on iTunes and on YouTube if possible as well, because I'm trying to get the YouTube channel going. The traffic's not so good there. And rate and review on iTunes and Stitcher if you have a moment. It's always appreciated and it's very helpful. So that's it. I will see you very soon. Thanks again for listening. All the best. Goodbye.